So for some of you, these notes in this lecture and these slides are going to be pretty familiar. Um, it is a similar lecture that you took notes over um, in eighth grade on Jackson's presidency and what he did. However, we're going to be looking at Jackson's presidency, this unit, through the lens of Oklahoma, through the perspective of the people that this president's policies impacted and influenced and affected. And that is going to be the lens that we're going to look through this information, even if it is information that you may have seen before. So Jackson is going to be the first president not from Massachusetts or Virginia. So Jackson was born in 1767. Um, he is born in South Carolina, but is going to be raised and will live in Tennessee. As we, as we spoke about a little bit yesterday uh, in class, the portion of the middle Midwest, South, uh, part of the United States is going to grow pretty significantly. Um, from really the get-go, there's going to be a, a group of people that are going to move west pretty quickly after the United States gets its independence from Great Britain. They're going to move west of the Appalachian Mountains into what we would consider the Midwest today. The significance, again, uh, of Jackson being from Tennessee is that he's going to be the first president not from Virginia or Massachusetts. He's a military man, and he um, becomes famous for his uh, victory in the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. So he will actually be in charge of the Battle of New Orleans, which is why in New Orleans there's a statue of Jackson in the uh, center of the city. Um, the Battle of New Orleans will actually happen after the end of the uh, War of 1812. Um, it will be um, one of the battles that is fought after the treaty had been signed, but word hadn't gotten back to New Orleans that uh, the war had ended. So he is a, a military hero from that war, even though the war um, was inconsequential to the, uh, the end of, of the uh, War of 1812 between the United States, the young United States and Great Britain. So Jackson did have a political life after his military career. He's going to be a senator from Tennessee um, and is going to serve in the state of Tennessee's early government uh, in many different roles. He's going to run for president in 1824 against John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay. This is a picture of or a painting of Jackson in 1824, um, the year that he will run for president for the first time. So this is the electoral map of Jackson's election uh, with John, uh, the, the electoral map of the election between Jackson, John Quincy Adams, Crawford, and Henry Clay. So as you can see, Jackson is going to be the green, is going to win a, a number of the states in the South. Crawford is going to be in the blue in 1824. Um, he's going to win Virginia, which has a ton of electoral votes. Um, he's going to win part of New York, and he's going to win um, Georgia as well. Crawford is from Georgia, so this shouldn't be too surprising that he's going to win Georgia. Had he not been from Georgia, Jackson probably would have won Georgia. Clay is going to win uh, what we would consider the Midwest, Missouri, Kentucky, and Ohio. Um, he's also going to win part of, of New York as well. Adams is going to win the Northeast, where he's from. He's from Massachusetts. He's going to win a big portion of New York and uh, the mid uh, sorry, the northeast portion of the United States, and, Jack and Jackson in the green is going to win uh, the south and some of the states in the Midwest. Um, uh, some electoral votes from Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. But you'll notice that even though Jackson um, wins the uh, popular vote with uh, 43%, he's going to not quite get to the 51% of the electoral vote that is needed because there are four other candidates or three other candidates in the race. So 
to win the presidency, you need over 50% of the electoral college vote. In 1824, there were uh, 261 electoral votes. There are 270 now. And those 270 get divided by um, the 50 states every 10 years through the census. So 261 electoral votes, Jackson or whoever's going to win will need more than 50% of the vote. Jackson is um, not quite to 50% of the electoral vote, even though he wins the majority. So if you don't receive 50% of the vote, then the vote is sent to the representative, House of Representatives to break the deadlock. And one of the reasons why it's sent to the House and not to the Senate or to the states is because there's more direct representation in the House of Representatives. So each state has uh, representatives based on the number of people that live there, the population. Um, and so if you're a bigger state with a bigger population, you have more representatives than smaller states with smaller represent representatives. This is going to be where the tie is going to be broken. Um, there's not a tie in this race, but if there was a tie, it would be broken in the House of Representatives. The not getting to 50% is also going to be broken um, in the House of Representatives. So John Quincy Adams is the is the um, main competitor with Andrew Jackson, um, but they're not going to either receive enough votes to win. So when the decision goes to the House of Representatives, Adams is going to be named the winner. Jackson knew that Henry Clay had used his influence as Speaker of the House to get Adams elected. Jackson is going to call this move by Clay and Adams the corrupt bargain. Election of 1824 called the corrupt bargain. What will happen is that Clay will, will remove himself from any um, contention and use his influence as Speaker of the House to get Adams elected. One of the reasons why it becomes a corrupt bargain is that Adams will then name Clay his Secretary of State. If you become Secretary of State in a lot of ways, you have enough experience to then run for president again. So Clay will run for president a number of times. He's going to lose a number of times, um, unfortunately for him. Um, but in 1828, Jackson is going to run against... John Quincy Adams, and this is the electoral map in 1828. So not only does Jackson now win all of the South, he's going to win all of the Midwest, he's going to lose the Northeast to Adams, um, but he's going to dominate Adams both in popular vote and electoral vote. We want to make sure that we remember this slide because this slide is going to be consequential to the Indian Removal Act in 1830. Um, because of the support that Jackson gets from the South and Southeast. Jackson's going to win a landslide against Adams, and he's going to inherit a quote-unquote mess. Jackson is going to um, be receiving a country that um, might actually be considered a mess with um, a, a panic, a small recession that has happened as a result of Adams' presidency. Um, he's also going to be very outspoken against um, Adams as a president and is a precursor with the seventh president to what will happen with the 44th and 45th president um, and presidents before where campaigning becomes uh, not only just about what you can do, but what the other person can't do. So what will, I, what will Jackson be inheriting? Well, he'll be inheriting the tariff of abominations. So under Adams, Congress is going to pass a huge tariff that is going to affect many Americans, most notably the ones in the South. So a reminder, a tariff is a tax on imports, and tariffs are taxes that are, are, are imposed to protect industry in the country. So the tariff of abominations is a very large tariff that will protect American factory workers factory owners, um, because it will make goods more expensive. What ends up happening is that a lot of the rural communities living in the South, they will want to not have tariffs because they want to pay as little as possible for goods that are manufactured. Because remember, the economy of the South during this time is largely agrarian or full of agriculture. 
and they're going to sell their products all over the world that they grow in the south and they want to make money and so they're going to they're going to react negatively to the tariff of, abomin- of abominations because if the United States has high tariffs, there's going to be less business for them to do with other countries because it's now more expensive to get um, to purchase things um, and to sell things in the United States because of these large tariffs. Um, so this is what Jackson is going to inherit. And it, it, quite frankly, is a mess because South Carolina is going to threaten to leave the United States if the tariff of abominations is not changed. So what this will lead to is the nullification crisis. So the main point of South Carolina's argument was over nullification of the power to, of the state to reject federal law. This is their argument, basically, that, that the states have power given to them by the Constitution that they can reject federal law if they want to, if they don't agree with it. It's called nullification. This, of course, is not what the Constitution uh, set out to do. It is pretty much illegal, and uh, Jackson is going to make sure that South Carolina knows it. So if South Carolina was going to secede from the Union, Jackson would bring them back in using military force. And remember, Jackson's background is in military um, command, and this is something that, that many historians believe would not have gone well for South Carolina um, because of Jackson's focus on um, the military and his background on the military. Um, there would have been a civil war earlier had South Carolina seceded. The threat by Jackson is going to be enough to get them to not leave the Union. The second thing that Jackson goes after um, after he ends the nullification crisis is the second bank of the United States. Jackson's main economic policy was decentralization. So moving things away from moving things that produce money, moving those away from the control of the federal government. It's a big word. And what decentralization means is that each individual state is going to be left to their own devices to do their own thing. People, states, and businesses would, would have little interference from the federal government. This is you know, what largely... Um, many people in the United States still believe today is that decentralization is a good thing and the government is corrupt and um, shouldn't be the, the, um, the group of people or the body of people that um, control economics. And um, in, a lot, in a lot of ways that is true and some other, in some other very consequential ways that is not necessarily true because there are consequences to letting people do their own thing. So in an effort to spite his political opponent, Henry Clay, yes, the same guy who's still the Speaker of the House, He's not going to renew the charter of the Second Bank of the United States. This is the same bank that Alexander Hamilton is going to establish in the very beginning of the country. It's a central bank of the United States with branches all over the country. This decentralization is going to to privatize banking, meaning that it's going to be um, going to move banking from something that the government controls to something that individual businesses control. And banking becomes a very profitable business, and it is still today. Many people do not like this policy, but there are many people who do. So people that don't like this policy are typically factory owners that live in the Northeast. Clay and Adams's people. Jackson is going to be coming from the South, and there's a disconnect. We talk a lot about disconnects we have so far this year. There's a disconnect between people living in the rural South and people that live in big cities like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, um, there's going to be a disconnect that Jackson is going to see and is going to exploit. And people are going to love him for this because if you're a poor farmer and you want to grow your business, you're probably only going to be able to do that if you get a loan from the bank. But the bank is run by the government, and when the government controls the lending, they don't really understand what's going on in the in the South because they are far away from the South. Um, And this break from the norm is going to make Jackson really popular with people who live in the rural South. And remember, at this time, the people that could vote, because slavery is still existing um, in the South particularly, are white males, are um, are the group of people that are able to vote. And so Jackson is going to get a lot of popularity, especially from the South, from this white male voting group that live in the South. 
This is a picture of the Second Bank of the United States in Philadelphia. You can actually go continue. You can you can still to this day visit it. Um, it looks just like that. Um, there are obviously differences around it, but um, it's located very close to um, Independence Hall, where they set, where they signed the Declaration of Independence. And um, Philadelphia is the first capital of the United States um, before Washington D.C. Um, so a lot of the historical buildings from the early days of the country, from eighteen 1783 to 1787 um, exist in Philadelphia. Here is where we get to Jackson's presidency as it relates to Native Americans and why this matters to us as Oklahomans, because uh, we live in um, a place that is a direct result of Jackson's policies with the Native Americans. So as we are going to see um, over the course of the next few days is that many Native American tribes are going to uh, live in the southeast part of the United States. We saw this in the reading we did um, over the Cherokee that they live in the southeast part of the United States. The land they live on was super valuable, and many, mainly, white Americans in the south wanted the land. And by valuable, what we're talking about is gold was discovered there. Um, there is a big chunk of land that is available um, for people to live on. And that land has natural resources and has all these things. The trouble that we saw when we looked at the uh, primary source from the Choctaw, or sorry, from the Cherokee, is that it doesn't belong to the United States. It belongs to the Cherokee Nation. So 1830, Congress is going to pass the Indian Removal Act, and um, Jackson's going to sign it happily. And it's basically going to, to um, rip the previously signed treaties between the U.S. government and the five Native American tribes from the Southwest, Southeast. And it's going to essentially create a new one without any of the um, approval of the Native Americans tribes. It's going to force those five tribes, known as the five civilized tribes, um, to move to new territory west of the Mississippi River. It's going to be called Indian Territory. It's later going to be renamed Oklahoma. Um, they are going to be forced by the military to leave their homes, their ancestral homelands, um, along a journey that is, that is known as the Trail of Tears. And for many people, this experience is um, traumatic, it's deadly, it is devastating, it's not done with any dignity, um, it's basically, um, for many people, a it's time to leave your ancestral homelands, get as much stuff as you can packed up, and get moving, because this land is no longer yours. And that is a um, generalization of what actually happened, um, and a summarization of what happened, um, but for many people, that is the reality of what happened. Um, the military is going to force them off of this land. And you might be thinking, how can they do this? How can the government do this? Well, if the law changes by the U.S. government um, and it's passed by Congress, so all states have had a say in it, um, the president signs it, there is um, some connection between the legislative and executive branches um, that goes a long way to um, what gets enforced and what doesn't um, in uh, the laws of the United States. And the Native Americans, the tribes themselves, um, have, as we're going to see, very little to protect themselves from this um, new law that has been passed. They're not going to have a very strong military to uh, react to this law um, violently, and they're not going to have any legal status or basis because um, Jackson is going to throw their treaties away um, through this uh, passage of the uh, Indian Removal Act in 1830. So this is the... Um, this is a map of the Trail of Tears. It is the 
map that shows the many journeys that the people um, who travel along the Trail of Tears uh, venture on. The first to leave are the Choctaw in 1830. The last to leave are the Cherokee in 1835. The Cherokee that we're talking uh, about yesterday with the reading are going to have a lengthy legal battle with the um, U.S. government um, that they're ultimately going to win, then um, still will be forced to leave in 1835 to Indian Territory. What you'll notice in Oklahoma is that um, they will all come through um, Tahlequah and Fort Gibson that we know today. Um, the Cherokee are going to come the northern route. Everyone else is going to come the southern route. Um, the Choctaw will be in the, in the southeast. The Creek and Seminole will be in the um, central part of, of uh, Indian Territory. The Chickasaw will have the southwest. The Cherokee will have the north. Um, and that will be the five civilized tribes in Indian Territory. You'll notice that it's not, it does not include parts of Texas, um, this does not include parts of the panhandle as well. We'll talk about the panhandle, um, in a, in a couple of units, um, as we, we get closer to statehood, but these are the tribes and this is when they'll be removed. And this is the uh, journey that they'll take. Um, many of them, uh, this, this journey takes a long time. If we were to measure this, we would see that it's uh, many thousand miles that they have to walk. Um, and, and the journey is treacherous because this is uncharted for the most part, uncharted lands, and they'll move. Um, they'll move west um, at the at the uh, command of the U.S. government. So um, this is an excerpt of quote from Andrew Jackson um, about his reaction to the um, Indian Removal Act. The reaction by the Native Americans, like I said, the Cherokee are going to sue the state of Georgia over the law. They're actually going to win. The Supreme Court is going to rule in their favor. Chief Justice John Marshall is going to declare that the Indian Territory is admitted to compose a part of the United States. He's going to affirm that the tribes were domestic dependent nations. So um, they are dependent on the United States, but their relationship to uh, the United States resembles that of a ward to his garden, guardian. So they live in the United States, their land is in the United States, but they get to act relatively independently. Marshall is going to deny Indians the right to court protection because they're not subject to the laws of the Constitution. However, because they are a distinct uh, political entity, they are capable of managing their own affairs. So they are independent to manage their own affairs. They don't necessarily have to follow the laws of the United States. Um, and this is what the Supreme Court's going to affirm um, in 2020, um, that it will be under the legislation of the tribes to handle their own affairs. And so the um, Cherokee are, are thinking that they have won a huge legal battle. Um, in the Supreme Court. Jackson is going to react by saying John Marshall has made his decision. Let him enforce it. John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, is who he's referring to. So in your notes, I'd like you to write down what you think Jackson means by this. 